Good morning and welcome to the broadcast today. And thank you again for joining us here at the Mount Zion AME Zion Church in Montgomery, Alabama, the capital of dreams. And we're glad that our ancestors were dreaming and listening to God and visualizing what the future was going to be for their children. And certainly God honored their faith God actualized their visions, God fulfilled their dreams, and we are glad to be the recipients of what they uh, struggle for so very greatly. We're glad to be the recipients of progress from their blood, sweat, tears, and faith, and their trust in God. And so welcome again to Black History Month and to the first Sunday of February, here at the Mount Zion AME Zion Church. Today's broadcast goes out in memory of two individuals. One, Mr. Uh, Anthony Boyd, uh, gone on to be with the Lord who served our country uh, and who was one of our online members faithfully for the past uh, four years or so. And then uh, Mr. Mosley Murray Jr., uh, who's going to be uh, eulogized today at one o'clock from the Ross Clayton Chapel. Let me thank you again. Today is Black History. Uh, and so uh, I'll call the name of the late Reverend L. Roy Bennett, who was pastor of the Mount Zion AME Zion Church in 1955 when the Montgomery bus boycott was organized and the Montgomery Improvement Association was founded. And so uh, to the Reverend, the memory of the Reverend Elroy Bennett, we praise God. And of course, to my favorite of the female her heroines, uh, the late Mrs. Harriet Tutman, who I believe was one of the greatest souls that has ever touched American soil. And so for her underground railroad leadership efforts, her courage, her faith, uh, her perseverance, uh, her courage, her bravery. I mean, I am just awed as we think about that today. Well, I'm wearing my Black History bracelets where I thought I was. I will be wearing them uh, in a few moments here at uh, the Mount Zion Church so that we'll continue to foster our Black history emphasis. And as I've said, uh, Black history, this one says uh, Black history all day, every day. And it has a line crossed through the month, says it's not Black History Month, it's Black history all day, every day. And certainly uh, that's a very true statement because we are Black history. All right, that being the case, we'll talk more about that as the month goes on. Today, we're talking about power without equal. I think that's a good subject to begin uh, this first Sunday of Black history. Uh, power without equal. And I think that's a good place to start because uh, our forefathers and mothers understood that God was the power without equal. Uh, there's an adult lesson title. Listen to this. Faith in the power of God. And there are times in life when only the power of God can bring you through or bring you out of the situation that you're in. And so you're encouraged today to have faith in the power of the living God. Sometimes people don't believe that uh, anybody can help them. But listen, uh, there is somebody who can help you. There is somebody who has supreme power, who has all powerfulness. And the God Almighty, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who gave Jesus to the earth through the Virgin Mary, of Peter and Paul, he is the God of our creation, of our salvation, of our rapture, and he has all power in his hands. All right. So we're going to uh, the prophet Isaiah chapter 40 is where our lesson is from today. Isaiah chapter 40. We're going to begin reading at verse number 12. 
and then we'll go into verses 25 through 31 uh, for the rest of the lesson today. Father, I thank you and I praise you today. You are great. You are wonderful. You are good. There is no error, no fault, no mistakes, no sin in you. But with your righteousness and your holiness, you rule and super rule the world and the universe. And today, as always, we pause to thank you for being God all by yourself. God, in the midst of our triumphs and in the midst of our struggles, we thank you that you are always with us. We never walk alone. We are never by ourselves because you promise and you have always kept your word to be with us. Give us revelation. Give us insight today into the word of God. This is your word. Give us humility of head and heart so that we are not just hearers of the word of God, but doers of your word in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right, let's go quickly to Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 12. Who has measured the waters of the sea in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span? enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has instructed him? Now, of course, when the Bible raises questions like this, there are certainly, uh, the only answer you can say is nobody. Uh, there's so certainly nobody who can say, well, I was there with God and I weighed things out. I weighed the mountains and I put the hills in a balance and I've been God's counselor. No, all of us believe in the existence. Uh, not all of us, uh, all of us who are Christians believe in the existence of God, in the omnipotence of God. That's all powerfulness of God. And we believe in the omniscience of God, that he, he's all-knowing. He knows about everything. And we believe in the omnipresence of God. He's present here as he is in Japan, as he is in Russia, as he is in Africa, and all the rest of the parts of the world at the same time. Now, those of us who are Christians, we believe that. But periodically, God would say to his people, Israel, uh, he raises these uh, rhetorical questions, I guess, uh, to say to Israel, have you forgotten who I am? Now, God knew who he was, but Israel continuously functioned as if God was not their God. And so periodically, God would come back and ask Israel, do you know who I am? Now, God had a, uh, a way of doing it in different ways. Early on in the book of Isaiah, he says, uh, the, the ox knoweth its owner uh, and, and the donkey his master's crib, or the donkey knows his owner and the ox his master's crib. He said, but Israel don't know me. And so over and over again, God would challenge Israel to function as if they knew who he was and to live in trust and obedience and to walk in his commandments. So uh, God's children had been deported uh, into Babylon. And because they were deported into Babylon, exiled from the promised land, perhaps many of them felt as if God had abandoned them. You know, I've heard people talk like that as if God had abandoned them. God hasn't abandoned us. I've never felt abandoned uh, in my life. I've had some storms. I've had some ups and some downs, but I have never believed that the almighty God abandoned me. And so while they were in Babylon, they were struggling with this, <clears throat> with the dynamics of being in Babylon. And of course, <clears throat> sometimes when you're going through the storm, 
uh, we would say you can't see uh, the sunshine because you're in the storm. But how many of you know that God always has sunshine in the midst of the storm? And so here we are. Here we are again now with God questioning his children about their trust in his power and his ability to get everything done. And so uh, the questions, let, let me read them again because I love these questions. Because uh, if, if you were in uh, the children of Israel's predicament, you would have to come away and say, I'm, I'm, I'm not living in faith now. I'm not trusting God. So let me just ask you, since you're not in their predicament, are you trusting God and are you remembering that God, your God, is without equal even to this day? There is nobody like him. I love, uh, I love God. I love trusting in God. I love bragging on him because you know what? There's nobody else like him. There's nobody that can, can handle him. There's nobody that can do what he does. There's nobody that can stop him. He's unstoppable. There's nobody get, that can phantom all of the dynamics and the details about him because his ways are past finding out. I love him because he's God all by God's self and nobody can stand in his way. Now, listen to the question. He said, who measured the waters of the sea? Eh, that would be nobody in the hollow of his hand, okay, the, the waters of the sea in the hollow of his hand. Say, well, we can measure the, the waters of the sea now, but you can't measure them in the hollow of your hand. Uh, uh, or who marked off the heavens with a span? I, I, who marked the heavens off? Uh, that would be a, a, a feat. Who enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains? So who knows how much dust there is in the earth? That's baffling. Let's go on. Who weighed the mountains in scales? Uh, weighed the mountains? Weighed the mountains? <laughs> uh, nobody that we know of in the earth or under the earth, but we know God knows how much the mountains weigh. Listen, and the hills in a balance. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or who has been his counselor to instruct him? Now, I've had counselors in my day, both in the high school and in college and in post, post-grad school too. I've, I've had um, counselors that were people I like bouncing ideas off of and getting their perspective and their ideas. But who counsels God? And the answer is nobody. All right, I'm going to verse 25. To whom then will you compare me, God is asking? Or who is my equal? The answer is nobody, uh, says the Holy One. Who do we compare God to? Not you. Now, there are people who sometimes seemingly want us to uh, treat them as if they are God. But we know better. So don't worry, we're not. We know that you're not God. And, and we're not going to function like that. I don't want people to treat me like, like I'm some otherworldly person or no, I, I am not God and I'm not otherworldly. I'm a human being uh, here by the grace of God to serve the Lord, to be it for the kingdom, to proclaim uh, his gospel and to serve this present age. There are plenty of people to compare me with, starting with I've got three older brothers still alive. Uh, and and three younger brothers uh, alive. I've, I've got children. Uh, I've got friends. I've got people I don't know. You can always compare us, but who do we compare God to? Can't compare God to anybody because number one, everybody that you know is already flawed. Everybody you know has sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everybody that you know has weaknesses. Everybody that you know cannot think perfect thoughts all of the time. Everybody that you know does not do righteous all of the time. So who do we compare God to? Nobody. Nobody. Look at verse 26. Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? Uh, well, we've created, uh, we've made a lot of things 
invented a lot of things we say. But when we look up at the sky, who created that? It's raining outside. Who created the rain? And the clouds that are out there. He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power. Not one is missing. Have you ever gone out at night when it was a starry night? And you just see the multitude, the galaxy of the stars. And, the, and Isaiah says, who knows how many is out there? That's beyond our comprehension and beyond our knowledge. He said, who created all of this? We're still trying to study things and figure out this and understand this and see why this, you know, we're still trying to do these things. And he's saying, but God knows all of these by name. And God has already numbered on, it is a mind boggling thought that God knows all of the stars and has named them. And then he says that last thing, I like that last thing. Let me read that. It, it says, and not one of them is missing. <laughs> we've, had, we've had trouble keeping up with one child or two or three, or however many you had. And, and God knows all of the stars by name. And not a single one is missing. Now, that's about as baffling as it gets. Look at verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Now, here we are. People are always blaming God as if God can't see. God is not like us. And some of us have better vision than others. As I was teasing uh, somebody last night, I said, you better keep your glasses on because from the way you're seeing, it looks like you're about to be uh, in my category. And I don't want them to be in my category because I've got to have these glasses on to see well, okay? And But God is not like, God is always seeing. He's not missing something over here because he's busy handling something over here. God sees everything. Quite aware of what's going on in Africa, in the Sudan right now. He knows what's happening in Mozambique, in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Togo, in Malawi, Malawi in Uganda. And Rwanda, but at the same time, while he's all over the continent of, of Africa, he knows what's happening in France, or let's just do the continent. He knows what's happening in Europe. And then he knows what's happening in Asia, over in Australia, in the down under, and yet knows everything that's going on in America right now, even the crooked thing. God is always aware of your ways. And God always sees whatever is going on with you, whether it is good or bad. So we don't have to ask or we don't have to say, uh, why why isn't God looking at me? Or why is my way hidden from and And why is he disregarding me? God's not disregarding you. Maybe you're in a bad place. That doesn't mean God is disregarding you. All of us share in bad places from time to time. Now, I know it as well as anybody what it's like to be in a bad place, okay? I love this church tremendously because when I was in a very bad place, this Mount Zion church put their arms around me and loved me for God and made me know that God was still with me. That was important. I was in a bad place, but I never thought that God was not here. I didn't think it because of my faith in him, but I also didn't think God was disregarding me because his children in this congregation 
put their arms around me and said good things to me, walking out of the sanctuary. And they would say, hold your head up. We're with you. And God is with you. And they pray for me. And, and so God has never disregarded you. You said, well, Reverend Schubert, I don't have all of that. You got to have faith to believe God loves you and that God is not disregarding you. God loves you and God is not disregarding you. He can't do that. God is love. Love does not disregard. God is love and love will not disregard you. Whether you're in need or whether you are level the ground or whether you're flying high like an eagle. Look, look at the next thing. Here's the favorite part of today's lesson. I've got to hurry. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Listen, folks, haven't you heard how awesome and powerful God is and that God doesn't get tired like us? I got up a little later this morning and... Uh, as I was on the way out the door, uh, my wife said to me, you're a little late this morning, aren't you? Well, I wasn't late for the broadcast, but she knows I normally leave an hour sooner than what I left this morning. And I said to her, I was tired. So I stayed in the bed a little longer. And she had been up but God doesn't get tired. God doesn't get weary. God doesn't have to replenish or have his strength renewed. He doesn't need a refreshing. Sometime uh, we need a vacation. I was talking to a friend last week. I said, it's about time. I've got to get, I've got to get a vacation. It's, it's, it's about time now. I've been rolling and rolling and rolling from funeral to funeral to funeral and, and study to study to study and sermon to sermon and hospital to hospital. I said, it's about time now. Uh, the old body tells you when it's time. But God doesn't get weary. Aren't you glad we serve a God who doesn't need a vacation? <laughs> who doesn't have to take time off? Who is always refreshed are always fresh, not refreshed. He's always fresh. He's always energized. He's always at his best. He's always full of life. He's always full of love. He's always full of power and strength, all power and strength. There is nobody like him. He has no equals. You have an equal. <laughs> I have an equal. Uh, my second oldest brother, uh, Dr. James Shuford, who uh, is an agronomist, He's, he loves the plant and soil, uh, and that's been his career. He said to me, uh, you, you're going to get older. We were, we were talking and riding this past week for a short time. He said, uh, wait until you get to be a little older. He said, other things are going to change. And he's good 75 and, and I'm a good 64. So you can see the difference, right? And he's going to be 76 this year. And I've already had my birthday. So he said, but you've got to, get, you're going to get older and you're going to notice things are changing. Listen to this, but I'm, here's what's not going to change. God, hallelujah. God is not going to change. He does not get faint. He does not grow weary. He does not need a boost. He is God, self-existent. As he said to Moses in Exodus chapter three, when Moses asked, who should I tell them that is sending me? 
And God said to them, you tell them I am who I am. Tell them I am has sent you. Tell them that self-existent, almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing God has sent you. Wow. Look at what as Isaiah says, uh, God says in Isaiah. Uh, he gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. So if you are faint, weak, or if you are powerless, God gives strength to the weak and the powerless. He gives us strength when we're weak and powerless. Now, I know this to be a fact uh, because there have been times I was getting ready to lead worship and to preach. And uh, unlike today, I don't feel drained today, but there have been times I was getting ready to preach and to lead worship and I felt so drained and exhausted. And I prayed in the corner, prayed uh, in the corner of the sanctuary. And sometimes after I sat in the sanctuary seat, I would pray and say, God, uh, I need help. I need you to help me today. I need you to revive me. And I would stand up to preach and God would revive me. And I would feel as though I could run with the greyhounds or, or with the horses. <laughs> at least for a while. And when I finished my assignment, I was depleted again. It was time to go home then, eat and, and get some rest. But God gives what? Strength to the weak and the powerless. He knows how to bring you back. Now I've got to hurry. I've got a couple of more verses. Verse 30 says, even youths will faint and be weary and the young will fall exhausted. So young people get tired too. People say, well, you're too young. People used to tell me this. You're too young to be tired nonsense. And I know they're just talking because sometimes they were tired and they, they would look at them and say, man, when I was your age, I didn't even get tired. Oh, really? Hmm. That would only be true if you weren't doing anything and you're dead. Everybody gets tired at some point and it has nothing to do with age. I called my 18-year-old daughter, graduating senior, and I said to her, uh, are you up? She said, no, dad. It was Saturday. She said, no, dad, I'm, I'm not up yet. I said, well, are you going to get up? She said, yes, dad, I'm going to get up sometime. She said, I'm tired. So she was catching up on sleep and rest. Everybody gets tired, and that's what it says here. Uh, the youth get weary and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God has a way of renewing our strength. Sometimes he does it miraculously. Sometimes he does it with you taking yourself to bed. Sometimes he does it with you uh, eating the right foods and reviving you and then taking a rest break or a vacation. But sometimes God miraculously revives us. Remember, and I'll end with this. Remember when uh, Elijah the prophet was in the desert? This is somewhere around uh, 1 Kings chapters 18 and 19. And the prophet was so exhausted and frustrated because Ahab and Jezebel wanted to kill him. And, and Elijah got to the point, he said to God, I'm just ready to die. He was exhausted. He said, take my life. I'm no better than the rest of the prophets. And he fell asleep out in the wilderness. And God sent him an angel, prepared him a piece of bread. He ate the bread. And the angel, the angel woke him up and said, arise and eat. He ate the bread and gave him some water, and he went back to sleep. And the angel came back and said, hey, uh, eat another piece of bread because the journey is going to be too great for you. And he ate another piece of bread and drank some more water. And the Bible says, in the strength of that food, he went 40 days before he ate and drank again. So God can miraculously renew your strength. He can miraculously revive you, refresh you. 
And I pray that God will do it. For those of you who are tired, who have been listening to me, may God do, do something miraculously in you and for you. May he revive you. May he set your soul on a hallelujah fire so that you revive spiritually as well. In the name of Jesus. My time is up. I'm glad that you've been with us today as we've been talking about our unequal God and trusted in our God whose power is unequal. Sunday school is over for another day. Hear us, Heavenly Father, as to thee we pray. Through the week, be with us in our work and play. Make us kind and loving. Help us to obey. Amen. I'll see you the next time by God's grace. Bye-bye now.